think the sperm whale is the most extraordinary whale for very many different reasons. Number one, it's the whale we all drew when we were children. It's the sort of big square nose and the spout and the sort of smiley face. It's the kind of original, it's the Ur whale. And that's reflected in its place in natural history and in human history. These two things, I was speaking about this yesterday to the Whale Conference, how conflicted those two things are and how they create a lot of the tensions between us and specifically cetaceans, which is obviously the subject of this weekend. But the sperm whale has a very strange and odd kind of genesis in a way, because it's a great whale and yet it's a toothed whale. So it's kind of, it has this kind of dinosaurian aspect to it with these teeth and the fact that it is the greatest predator, it's a, a, the largest predator that's ever lived, you know, a larger predator than any of the dinosaurs. Um, it also has the biggest nose of any animal. And that great square forehead is, in fact, its nose, as many of you will know. Um, it's wreathed in superlatives. It makes the loudest noise of any animal, louder than a jet engine. It's one of the oldest of the whale species. It's very close to the original whales. It's been around possibly for 50 million years. At that point in time, People had not grasped even what a sperm whale looked like. Most people only ever saw them in illustrations or maybe stranded on the beach um, when they're bloated and out of shape. When Melville wrote Moby Dick, he actually referred to Thomas Beer as the most accurate depictor of the sperm whale, the man who had most closely got to it. And of course, Melville had spent two years at sea on whaling ships, so he very much did know what sperm whales looked like. And to him, it was this image, most of all, that, that represented what the sperm whale really resembled at sea. And if you ask your average American today, what is the number one marine conservation issue? They will say it's whaling. And if you look at it from strictly from a conservation point of view, it is not the number one issue. But it is an issue that it's possible to get traction with media, it's possible to get people enthused about whales. There's a strong animal rights factor that comes into this as well. You know, people love whales, and that's, that's why we're here. There are species that, are, that they are worth preserving and worth saving, and it's easy to get people motivated. Try and get people motivated to save cod, or haddock, or something like that. It's a much tougher challenge. And what's happened is there, it, it has become, in, in certain places, in West Africa especially, there is this ongoing feud between local fishermen and foreign vessels. And to give you the, the countries they're from, 50% of these foreign vessels are Chinese, and then the, the remaining 50% is pretty evenly split between Spain, Portugal, Korea, Taiwan, and Greece. The European uh, fleet are all heavily subsidised by, by the European Union. Um, so anyway, after, after meeting with these people and I sort of sat back and thought, you know, maybe there's something we can do here, I went and met with some government officials. And the trouble you've got when, when you're at countries recently out of civil war, you've got enough battles on your plate. And the fishing community is a very low profile element of community, largely uneducated, <coughs> um, very little voice in parliament. They're an easy sector to ignore. And that's what's happened in Africa. The, the governments have basically ignored their people, but they have many challenges. You know, the, you know, busy Sydney just trying to stop civil unrest, let alone worrying about the fisheries. Um, how, how big is the cell wagon bank? You know? The bank itself is 19 miles long, and it's roughly five miles wide. It's 100 feet, 30 meters deep on the top, but then it's more like 90 meters deep on either side. So, do you see any other expectations? We, um, two weeks ago there was a right whale. Um, they can be more spring and fall. We've had blue whales, say whales, um, rizzos. We had common dolphins this summer, which is a new one. Uh, harbor porpoise, pilot whales. I don't know if the other stuff is normally there, but we just kind of go to where the humpbacks are so we don't go exploring. You know what I mean? But if there aren't any humpbacks around and we're out looking for whales, I think that's when we've picked up the other species. But sometimes we get six species days. Frequently say that we're in the Caribbean when we're doing this trip, 
It's more accurate to say that we're in the southwestern North Atlantic because we are north of the equator, so it's the North Atlantic, but the southwestern corner of it, so it's actually the southwestern North Atlantic. But if you want to tell your friends you went to the Caribbean, I'm sure the Dominican Department of Tourism won't have any problems with that. So here we are coming in a little bit closer now. This is the island of Hispaniola, which includes Haiti on the uh, western third approximately, and then the Dominican Republic on the eastern two thirds. Uh, again, this is a closer look. The uh, Navidad Bank, the Silver Bank, and you notice uh, the size of it there. It's about uh, 80 miles, 75 miles from here out to there to give you a little bit of sense of scale. You know, the Dominican Republic is a, uh, a third world country, a developing country. Uh, they don't have a whole lot of financial resources and it would be very easy for them to um, go another way with, with the whales down there. And you know, the, it's hard for some of these small countries when they receive an offer of 10 or 20 million dollars it's very hard for them to turn that down sometimes. And so you know, the Japanese have been in other places essentially buying, buying boats on the IWC to try to overturn the moratorium that was established in this building 30 years ago. So the Dominicans deserve a lot of credit for not um, going that route and establishing the sanctuary and continuing to increase the scope of the sanctuary, but also continuing to limit the amount of activity in the sanctuary. We're home to more than 20 different species of cetaceans and 17 of them have been sighted within the boundaries of that sanctuary, so it's for a lot more than just the humpback whales. Now, these are North Atlantic humpback whales. They come down to the area of the Dominican Republic and the, and the Caribbean um, during their breeding season, but during the, their summertime feeding season, they are much further north in an area like the Stellwagen Bank, which is a sister sanctuary of the, the Dominican Republic sanctuary, and then also much further off the map up towards Greenland and Iceland and uh, Norway and et cetera. So they, they get around quite a bit up in the Gulf of Maine. Part of the reason the sanctuary is so important is because uh, humpback whales exhibit feeding site fidelity. In other words, they go back to the same areas to feed every year, whether that's the Stellwagen Bank or up off of Greenland or Iceland, wherever it may be. But then they do all tend to come down towards the Caribbean and also a few off the Cape Verde Islands where those different populations mix for breeding, which is good for genetic diversity. So that makes the Silver Bank a very important place in the life cycle of the North Atlantic humpback whales. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Doug Allen. Thank you very much. Now, I was going to just mention briefly, I know that all you parents out there are really keen to give your uh, children a big interest in, uh, in the wildlife and uh, natural history under the sea. And I know that all the children out there are really want to get in the water with marine mammals. So my suggestion is, Christmas, go and swim with manatees. Manatees are found in Florida, and you go to a place called Crystal River. They come out of their sanctuary areas early in the morning, and they like nothing better than to swim over and get a good old scratch from you. They're one of the few completely wild animals that will actually come up to human beings and they know what they want. They roll over on their side and you have to scratch them like that. And it's really, it's the coolest thing you'll ever do. This is the leopard seal, which is the one that um, takes on penguins. And when they come up close to you in the water, they, they sometimes see themselves reflected in the, in the front of the lens, uh, in the curved surface, and they begin to behave towards the camera as, as if it was another leopard seal. And when they're hunting, they like to be on their own. And so their response to seeing what they think is another leopard suit <coughs> reflecting the camera is to do this big gape. And uh, this one, not long after the picture was taken, he took the whole of the front of the camera into his mouth. And I quite honestly could pull focus on his tonsils <laughs> because he was gently pulling the camera away from me and I was gently holding on to the camera, working with different whales. And um, been lucky enough to film some whales doing some neat things. We were uh, the first people in Blue Planet. We were the first people to film killer whales taking grey whales uh, off California. The grey whales are, are swimming from San Ignacio up, up the west coast of America, heading towards Alaska and the feeding grounds. And when the whales pass over Monterey Bay, there's a deep area across Monterey Bay that seems to be a favorite area where the killer whales can pick up the grey whales, and they come after the grey whales, and effectively they, well, they separate the, the calf from the female, and then, and this is something that's really interesting that a lot of people don't think about, but actually the Arctic 
The Arctic is basically a frozen ocean surrounded by land. You've got Greenland, the Canadian archipelago, Alaska, narrow entrance out to the Bering Sea in the Pacific, and all this is Russia, all the way around here, Norway, and a little gap into the Atlantic. And this is the frozen Arctic Ocean. Now, there's quite a lot of ice frozen up in Greenland, but basically all the rest of the ice in the Arctic is only sea ice, and the average thickness of that sea ice, even in the winter, is only about, about six or about seven metres, let's say. The narrow are these remarkable mottled grey whales, which uh, are their defining characteristic is the males have a single tusk coming out of the, the front of their jaw. It's a modified tooth. Uh, you, just to see these tusks coming up above the water is really remarkable. It's um, because often they just show their tusk, not the head, and it's just like these enormous toothpicks come up and start waving around. And we don't really know what's going on down below. We suspect that it's some sort of display. It's males basically displaying to each other and putting themselves in certain postures in the water. The cracks develop up across the ice, then the belugas and the narwhal will take advantage of that crack and that allows them to penetrate further into the otherwise solid ice. And uh, there's a wonderful place called Cunningham Inlet which you can go to, which is um, opposite of Resolute. Belugas are uh, probably the coolest whale around. They're very, very vocal. They're actually called sea canaries. They make, they make such a lot of noise. They squeak and they chirp and they whistle. And um, on a calm day, standing on front of the ice edge, you can hear them blowing from maybe a couple of miles away. You'll see the pod slowly starting to come towards you. Because these guys are hooking tuna from about seven or 800 feet down. And um, these killer whales come, and when they hook a tuna, they, the, the killer whales can hear the change in the engine note as the, um, the hooks take up the strain. And when the tuna is about halfway to the top, with the fishermen having done all the hard work of catching the tuna, the killer whales come in, and what the fisherman brings up <laughs> is often not, uh, not as much fish as he hoped, really. If you've ever wondered how you measure a killer whale, what you do is you put two lasers on top of your lens, and you calibrate them so they're exactly parallel, and um, you have them on top of your zoom lens, and when a, when a killer whale pops up, and you take a picture, and the fin is right in the middle, when you look at the picture, you can see the two green dots that have come out of the laser. Now, if those laser pointers are exactly parallel, and say they're 20 centimetres apart, then you know that those dots on the whale are 20 centimetres apart. So you can measure very accurately the width of that dorsal fin. And you can do that with different killer whales. There's that one, you can two green dots there. So you can measure. When, <clears throat> when later in the same encounter, you get that same whale, which you recognize by the saddleback pattern, when you get a picture that shows the fin and the blowhole length, because you got the dots on there previously, you know that distance. You can also then work out that distance. If you've got that distance, you have a very good idea how big that whale is overall. And now you can also say how old the whale is. So if you get enough of these sort of ID pictures of a whole pod, then you have a pretty good idea about the age structure um, of the pod. You can work out who the adults are, um, who the youngsters are, what their age is, and all the rest of it. And then if you ally it as well with a different kind of crossbow bolt, this one here, which you fire at a, at, um, a killer whale, and it pops in and pops out and collects a blubber sample at the same time. It collects just a little um, core of blubber out of the whale, and from that core of blubber, you'll get DNA, which will tell you who's related to who in the pod. And you can also tell from the blubber what the whale has been feeding on. Because basically, depending on the diet of the whale, there are certain chemicals, proteins, what have you, that migrate into the blubber. Shown off to the public, and um, he survived for uh, just over a year. And during that time, Ted Griffin decided he wanted a companion for that animal. So he went after another pod of whales, and he killed the mother, and uh, he captured the orphaned cub. And I'm sure you have all heard of Shamu, Sea World Shamu. That was the original Shamu. And of course, Shamu lives on, as we know. One Shamu dies, and another one takes over. And these whales can see as well above water as they can below it. 
and there are almost as many researchers as there are whales, 84 whales, almost as many researchers. So very likely it, this whale's going to see a researcher when it pops up, and that could just be Tucker the Scout Dog. <coughs> Tucker's a hyperactive dog, a conservation canine, and he is, he is trained to sniff out whale scat. So point the boat in the right direction and um, in the wind, and he, he will just a twitch of his, his ear, they have to watch him very carefully, and um, follow the whale, identify the whale, and then pick up the, the scout. The nets come out, he gets his reward, which is a big orange ball to play with. He's afraid of the water, so he's not going to jump in. A strict whale watching guidelines, 200 yards, federal regulation in Washington State, and uh, these are given out to, to people, to private boaters by Soundwatch, who are a volunteer organization um, sent out by the Weather Museum. Very often, private boaters don't know the rules. Orc Lab is up in Canada, and uh, mostly concerned with the northern residents, the southern residents. Uh, very, I, I'm not aware that Orc Lab is seeing too much of the southern residents. And um, again, the winter months, we just don't know where they go. They really do a disappearing act. And that is a big gap in the study, and one which they would really like to close. First of all, I must, must stress um, that I do not consider myself in any way to be a whale or general cetacean expert and uh, this afternoon if you come along you'll see why to a certain extent but um, as I'm not setting myself up as that but I have found myself for various reasons getting more and more involved in whales in particular over this past couple of months and already this morning I just found the whole thing absolutely fascinating. I've got some instant questions for all my panellists actually. Um, yeah, uh, first of all, <laughs> I want that explanation. What was it? Unconscious breath? Or conscious breath? Con unconscious breath adventures. Un unconscious breath adventures. I used to have a few of those back in the 80s, actually. But, uh, <laughs> no, 70s, actually. Now you brought me back. But can, can you explain that, please? Um, the Conscious Breath Adventures, the name of my company, uh, is based on the fact that cetaceans, which includes whales, dolphins, and porpoises, are, are conscious breathers. Um, you know, all mammals breathe. Uh, ourselves, our dogs, uh, cattle, anything like that, any terrestrial mammals, we all breathe, but we have the ability to go to sleep, to be unconscious, and continue to breathe automatically and still survive. Uh, cetaceans are conscious breathers. They have to choose when to uh, take each, uh, each breath. So they're what are known as conscious breathers. Um, and they, they swim through very simple patterns, and they stay semi-alert, probably because they've got to come to the surface to consciously breathe, and also they're alert in case something changes in the environment and they need to respond to it. For example, a predator might come by. But it is important also to know that, of course, that they need to rest. I mean, it'd be very nice if we could sleep with our, our brain turned off at one time. That would be very handy to us. We could appear to be quasi-alert this morning and still be resting, but we don't do that. 90 million years of different evolution, of separate evolution between them and the primate line but they do need to rest. They do need these quiet areas where they can quietly swim. And if you know dolphins very well, you can sometimes see them doing this in some areas. And that, of course, has implications for all the whale watching operations all over the world. Need, these animals need to rest. So those places where whale watching operations are going on every hour of the day, and the whales are surrounded by boats, or even if boats are present, affecting their environment, that probably isn't allowing the animals to rest as they need to, and that's something that we need to think about. I'm a big fan of whale watching, but it needs to be done properly. The um, meters don't eat us campaign, with little catchphrase given particularly to minky whales, and um, because minky whaling still goes on in Iceland, and a little bit of fin whaling as well, possibly. Uh, but it was fascinating to actually be confronted by people to whom I thought, wrongly as it turned out, that whaling had been a way of life forever. Actually, I was going to say the first thing you see, but the first thing you see are puffins, but not real ones, because Reykjavik is actually infested with fluffy puffins. If there's one thing that the Icelanders love because all the visitors love them, it's puffins. Bloody thousands. Of, I've never seen anything like it. Every shop you go to, puffins, 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 you go in there, you can get 
puffins in a snowstorm <laughs> in one of those little things like that. You can get a seven foot puffin. You can get puffin glasses, mugs, everything has got puffins on. And I couldn't help but notice there weren't any whales, it was puffins. You think this is what they really love here, this is where they make the money from the tourists. You've got great big signs, great big notices, you know, and uh, we more or less guarantee a whale sighting and it all looked fairly, uh, you know, nothing about it looked tawdry, it looked well organised. And there's a boat, there's a boat, whale watching boat, another whale watching boat, another whale watching boat. I went down that line of about six or seven whale watching boats all with little screens on and posters and, and identification maps and everything else. And then at the end of that line, along the same quayside, suddenly there were two more boats. Two more boats which were just flat and stark with great big winches on them and hooks at the front and virtually nothing else. Ominous looking boats. These were whaling boats. Oh, that's one plea to everybody. Um, if you're thinking of going to Iceland, don't have mail, uh, have whale on the menu, obviously. I mean, it's a different situation in each of the whaling nations. So I don't think you can really extrapolate across from, from one to another. And different techniques have been tried in different places uh, with, with varying degrees of success. I think in, in Iceland, and hats off to, to IFOR for their, for their good work there, uh, you've got a combination of things uh, going on. You've got a small community, it's like a small British town, um, which quite likes putting one or two fingers up at the international community in the Whaling Commission, you know, meetings. Um, it first whaled, I think, scientifically, so it used the, the loophole in the old moratorium to allow itself to go out and take some whales for scientific purposes, and then it invoked its objection, and then it went back scientific. It's been a whole mixture of things with, with Iceland, but it's small... Small country, small population, big influence from a, a certain sector. It's a community, like many northern communities, which has been very strongly associated with fishing in various forms. The arguments in Iceland, and this is a commonality with, with Norway and elsewhere, that they tend to believe their own arguments about the whales are eating all their fish. Of course, we are eating all the fish, and in fact, we are eating a lot of, of Icelandic uh, fish. The other thing with Iceland is that it has some very big whaling vessels. Um, Norway uses basically modified fishing boats and the fishermen are part-time fishing and part-time whaling. Uh, but in Iceland they have some very big boats which means that they can take the biggest whales of all. They are capable of taking fin whales which makes them interesting and they resumed um, some fin whaling uh, just a few uh, years ago. Whale populations were wiped out and some whale populations that used to go to certain areas to breed and feed are just disappeared. The rest of the species has no history of going to those places. They don't know that those places exist. And whales and dolphins pass information through the generations as a cultural inheritance as well as a gen genetic inheritance. So we have, in effect, knocked out those populations. Long before commercial whaling came along, we knocked out the northern right whale on this side of the Atlantic. It's the whale that's missing from our uh, fauna over here. So we have lost species, we have lost populations. Um, would there have been a genetic effect? Yes, almost certainly. But also, we need to start thinking, you biologists, you need to start thinking also about whales living within cultures. Talking about the uh, genetic issue, uh, we're definitely seeing more and more hybrids uh, between the big whales as well as smaller whales. Uh, there's, we know of hybrids between uh, blue whales and brooders whales, blue whales and fin whales. Uh, and we're starting to see hybrids of other species as well. And of course, when they're, when they're out there swimming around, you don't necessarily even realise that they're a hybrid, and it's not until they strand and, and we collect the data. So, you know, from a stranding point of view, we can collect an amazing amount of information. And unfortunately, that's also what they're saying for the whaling. You know, we can get information about these hybrids, and there are a couple of hybrids that have been reported through the whaling industry, and they're waving that around, saying, woohoo, we've got science. Um, so yeah, that's it's a, are they sterile? No, we're we're finding that they're breeding. Yeah. As as a non-biologist or whatever you want, to, um, is that is it a disaster if there's interbreeding? I mean, I can only make parallels with birds, and some people think it is, and some people don't. Yeah, I, I think I think in some instances it would be. Yeah, but if if it means that that's going to be the only way that we're going to see whales, then I say let them go for it. <laughs> Again, we need to look at this um, not on a global situation, and that, that's part of the problem if you look at how these species are ranked. 
it goes through uh, the IUCN red data list and they have a special panel for cetaceans and if you go in you can type in red list um, on Google and you'll find it and they basically have uh, listed for most cetaceans DD which stands for data deficient that means that they don't have enough information to classify them and I think that me personally, I've been pushing for us to stop looking at each of these species on a global stand and start looking at them on a regional or population or cultural stand. And that's what I pushed for in New Zealand to get the New Zealand orca listed and we got ours listed as nationally critical. It was only the second population in the world to be listed in terms of orca. Bowhead whales have recently been shown to live for about 200 years, making them one of the longest li living vertebrates of them all, which is extraordinary news. And you've got, this is an Arctic species, as most of you know. And why does it need to live? to tell me is it probably needs all that knowledge to help it exploit this very severe and very special environment. With bottlenose dolphins and most of the smaller dolphin species, their life cycles are very like ours, so they live naturally, they live about 40 or 50 years, females normally might live a little bit longer than males, there can be post-reproductive females, like we have, you know, grannies, who help look after the rest of the family, the whales, some of the whales clearly have that as well. So 200 years. We've we, got we one, know. yeah, we've got one orca that we believe is 100 years old, but we've certainly got a number that are at least in their 80s. Bowheads yeah. are exceptional. Bowheads yeah, are exceptional. bowheads are exceptionally old, 200. So in the Great Barrier Reef, um, there's a wonderful man called Alistair Bertels that studies the dwarf minke whales. They're using uh, whale watching vessels. And they have a particular way of, of looking at, at the animals there. They, they lower a rope off the back of the boat and they put all these people out and the tourists hang on the rope. Like so, a string of Christmas like a, lights. Yeah, like a string of Christmas lights full of, full of tourists of various shapes. Whites come along and nibble them Minky up. whales. <laughs> <laughs> like a big gone. kebab. <laughs> and, the, and the Mickey whales, uh, who knew Bill Oddie was funny? And the Mickey whales come over <laughs> and they look at the people and they belly pop and they jaw clap and they, they, they bubble stream and they do all sorts of things we didn't know about. The, the whalers this is, would have us believe that the minke whales are thick, they are simple animals. Hey, I'm answering your question, pay attention, stop talking to your friend. Um, <laughs> they, they would have us believe that I was a university lecturer at one time, can you tell? Um, were, the, the, the animals are very simple. The cockroaches of the sea was a, a, an expression coined by Komatsu, who was the Japanese commissioner, who was very outspoken, very good, very clever. Very clever man in many ways. They're not. They are, they are sophisticated animals, even the baleen whales, and they are very attractive. In, the, in, the, uh, in Antarctica, they've got nice white flashes on their, on their petrels, oh. and it's a, it's a different species now. It's not one global species. Species complex doesn't work well for cetaceans, by the way. No. It's kind of like saying, I, I use this example a fair bit, I could use the word hello with you. Okay, yeah. so I could go, hello, you, like, hello, Hi. you know, kind of, are you there? Yeah. Or I could go, hello. Yeah. See, they got it. They got it immediately, huh? I'll, Just like I'll that. I prefer the second. Yeah, excellent, yeah. excellent. But I could also go, hello. Oh, that's yeah. horrible. Yeah, that's not that so good. That should be huh? American. That's yeah. Really <laughs> so, you know, with one word, one word, no other context, just yes. one word, how I said it. Yes. And, and so we don't know yet whether um, we're interpreting these sounds correctly. Um, we've got some sort of a feel for it in some contexts, but we have absolutely no idea in others. And that's a really amazing opportunity for all of these biologists that are here to get involved in. Sound people. Um, um, which is, you know, entanglement and so on of albatrosses, whales, dolphins, um, the, and seabirds and so on. And this is the first time in my life that I heard about Hectors and Maui's dolphins. Hectors and Maui's dolphins uh, live on New Zealand's uh, island that uh, is uh, made up of two islands, the North Island and the South Island. Hectors dolphins live on the South Island, the blue area. Maui's dolphins live in the north, on the west coast of the North Island. They used to live almost all around this island but their range have, and numbers have contracted, and I'll come to that in a minute to a point where this is their last stand. So Hector's dolphins, what's the problem? In the 1970s, we had around 30,000 Hector's dolphins. Now we have about 7,200. And Maui's dolphins, the North Island species, is even worse off. In the 1970s, we had, 70s, we had about 1,000, and now there are 55. If you think um, that of those 55, Roughly half, just under half, will be breeding females. You can see how dire the situation of these animals is. That's a 94% drop, and there are less than 20 females left. 
gill netting and trawling are the problem, and they have decimated both Hector's and Maui's dolphins almost to the point of extinction. Scientists have recently had a little get-together and confirmed once again that fishing is causing almost 96% of the mortality of these animals. So, there is some good news. <laughs> the good news is that Hector's dolphins have been studied for about 30 years. So they're one of the best studied dolphin species or cetacean species on the planet. So they are dolphin species of extremes, the smallest, the rarest, and one of the best studied. So we know population sizes, we know reproductive rates, we know movements, we know seasonal changes in offshore distribution, where they go in summer versus where they go in winter. And they are one of just two dolphin species for which we know survival rates. I'm an audio recordist, I'm not a filmmaker or anything else like that, but Taiji in Japan has made me pick up the camera and try and document as much stuff as I possibly can to, to show you all the atrocities that are happening there. But it's important to get the message because, like I said earlier on, you cannot protect something that you don't understand and you need to be affected by what we put in front of you. If we just turn our heads and look the other way, then these animals have no voice. We have to be their voice for them. This is where sea shepherds sit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, documenting that. And this is the path of the dolphins. And at the back here is Kikatsura. And then the place I call Animal Auschwitz. Well, everything is covered in tarpaulin. This is, this is a picture taken from the top of um, Tsunami Hill and inside here is a bunch of dolphins that are being slaughtered and they're trying to hide them from us. And why do they cover stuff in tarpaulin? Well, um, Japan kill roughly 20,000 dolphins a year around Japan and Taiji's quota is 2,000 per season. 2,000 dolphins, resorrows, bottlenose, Pacific stripe, pilot whales, the whole lot. It's about killing dolphins and putting them into captivity and about money. And if you have a culture that you have to hide with blue tarpaulin, um, let's cover all the temples up as well. You know, it doesn't kind of make sense. I can tell you one thing, a lot of people are very concerned, okay? All the way from down there in Antarctica, all those organizations, some of the big organizations, Greenpeace, I4, WWF, they've been very concerned about the Southern Whale Sanctuary. You know, it's the biggest sanctuary, but you know what? It's the place where more animals are hunted than anywhere else. More whaling goes on there. And loads of other places, you know, people are concerned about the extinction of Maui dolphins. There's only 50 of those left. Loads of people are concerned about Taiji. Loads of people are concerned about whaling operations that might happen in, in Japan. Loads of people are concerned about offshore oil extraction. They come downstairs, find us, we're at the Save the Whales Reloaded stall. Draw your concerns, okay? It's time for you to draw the line. Thank you.